The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Your clients may want different things from retirement, but share a common need, income. Challenger's innovative lifetime income options are designed for today's retirees. With guaranteed regular income payable for life, regardless of how long your clients live, Challenger's lifetime income options help to manage longevity risks in a way many other investments can't. Help more clients do more, live more, create more. Contact your Challenger BDM or visit challenger.com.au forward slash portfolio dash outcomes. For a retirement portfolio that can deliver more, read and consider the Challenger Lifetime Annuity, Liquid Lifetime, PDS and TMD from challenger.com.au. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Joe Akiki, CEO at Akanbo Financial Group. Is that what you call yourself today, Joe? A CEO of Akanbo Financial Group or what, what do you call yourself these days? Uh, it's a good question. It sort of it changes day by day. That's probably... Accurate enough, mate. It's um, yeah, our business now. I mean, uh, it, it consists of many brands. So I suppose um, my, my role was originally limited to a Cambo. Now I've, I've oversees a few brands. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now I wanted to. We had a bit of a chat before before recording. I wanted to get you on uh, in, in particular. So a lot of these podcasts that I record, they're with you know, kind of solo operators. There might be two or three people in the business, maybe a couple of admin, some offshore support, whatever it might be. Uh, and then there's this kind of this chatter of of an emergence of bigger firms, what you know, whatever you want to whatever you want to call it, that they you know they've they've got a, a few staff, they're doing some acquisitions and so forth, and kind of that Cambo, First Financial, and and the other brands and so forth. Certainly in that. In that category, so I wanted to get you on to have a bit of a chat about kind of maybe the other end of the spectrum of financial advice, rather than just the, the small businesses. So can you can you talk a bit about maybe we'll start with like what does what does the business look like today? You mentioned like there's different brands and different kind of arms to the business. Like, well, what does it look like today? Yeah, so look to today across all of our brands in terms of staffing, it's about 150 staff. If I look at our our broader network, uh, one of our one of our offerings also has a, a licensing arm. Or for those listening, they probably know it more commonly known as like a dealer group, um, where we also also authorize about sixty advisors nationally. So, you know, all within our at Rico system, you, you're talking well over sort of two hundred. Um, and and in terms of our brands, um, it encompasses a Canby Financial Group, uh, First Financial, uh, Accordius. Um, as our as our three sort of key key brands, yep, yep. That, that we have in market at the moment, um, yep. um, and in terms of what we do, I mean, it's it's we're at our heart, at our core, we're obviously an advice business, um, and and over the years, um, uh, that's sort of evolved into asset management and funds management is a key part of our offering, um, and and really through necessity. Um, uh, we've we've evolved to to also offer um, insurance off specialized insurance offering a specialized um, a legal offering uh, as well as a, a lending um, a lending offering and on and we also provide SMSF administration services as well. So I guess you'd call it sort of end to end financial services. The, the one thing we we don't do is accounting, um, <laughs> and and there's good reason for that. So. Yeah, like how how did it. How did it evolve? Like, if you go back to your like your own personal story, maybe spend a bit of time talking about your own personal story, and then the evolution. Of like, you know, two hundred plus people that that certainly puts you at the at that pointy end of financial advice businesses now in the in the country. Uh, how did it get to that? <laughs> That's a good question. I I often ask myself that. Oh, look, it it still feels like yesterday when you know early days in the Cambo. 
you know, I remember, yeah, you'd sit in, a, in the room and the advice team would have been, you know, four or five people. I, I was looking after clients myself. You know, I was an advisor. I, I'd also act like a client service person when I needed to. I'd write my own SOAs because I didn't have a power planner. And, and like most small businesses, you know, you're trying to find cost efficiencies where you can. So we, we weren't outsourcing any of that. We didn't want to pay the money. I'd answer the phones. I was the receptionist. I'd, if, if I saw a client in the waiting room, I'd, I'd ask if they wanted a coffee. So it, it, it still feels like yesterday that, you know, like all small business owners, you sort of wear many hats. And yep. um, I suppose the one thing, James, that, you know, I was fortunate that my business partners at, at the time, everyone was really fixated on growing. And, and that's one thing that hasn't changed even to this day, that, um, We've been very deliberate about our growth, and, and I suppose I say deliberate in that I think often uh, in speaking to people, there's this, yeah, we want to grow, and, and I go, well, are, are you just hoping that that happens, or are you actually being quite deliberate about what, what you're what are you doing? doing about it? Yeah, That's right. Um, so I think if there's one thing that I'm just incredibly fortunate that I've always been surrounded by people with uh, aligned values and, and, and a real desire and commitment to growing, and, and we were very deliberate about that. So... Um, yeah, I suppose, and that—that's really what's led us to to where we are today. It's it's constantly resetting our objectives, and look, and I think the market in more recent times is 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 given us opportunity too, and 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 has opportunity for those who are willing to sort of take that leap of faith and um and aspire to grow. That the market is seeking that and and gives you that opportunity. Do you think the market's tough for like solo operators these days? Like you, you know you. You're at different conferences and you're talking to different people and you know there's been you know mergers and kind of acquisitions and bits and pieces a- a- along the way. Do you think it's you know tougher now for, for for smaller businesses than what it may have been in in years gone by? Like you started out as a small business. Yeah, uh, unquestionably it's harder. I mean, I think if you just look at anyone in the industry, if you just ask them, you know how they provide advice today compared to how they did it five years ago. I think the first comment that comes out of them, their, their mouth is going to be around the increased governance, you know, and, and whilst I think that, that it, in many ways it's been great because it's certainly is separating, you know, the great advice businesses and the great advisors from, from those that the industry clearly wanted to, to sort of address. Um, but it, but it's harder. I mean, from the ASIC levy to, the cost of running a license to, you know, uh, wages for employees to, you know, SGC goes up by another half a percent this year. So there, there's just these layers of, of costs um, and governance. And look, I think more than ever, um, scale is 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 really um, the only way to, to, to be able to make it worthwhile. And, mm-hmm. and in the conversations I have, and you're right. I'm fortunate enough to speak to a lot of a lot of other business owners and a lot of advice businesses, and um, more than ever, uh, I, I think it's becoming increasingly hard. Um, and that's really what drove us um, to to seek out that scale. Was that everyone you speak to, we're all trying to solve the same problems. And 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 one thing that uh, I certainly learned early on in the journey is that um, part of that small sort of business mindset, certainly that that I had, was. You want to try and do everything on your own, and mm. and I don't know whether that's that sense of independence or that or just that um, sense of you know ah oh, no one will be able to do it as good as me. And um, but one thing that certainly we've adopted along the way is the importance of having really good strategic partnerships, and um, and and that certainly allowed us to 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 grow and and I suppose focus on what we're really good at. And, and then leverage the expertise of others. And, and that just means that success is more fun when it's shared with others too. So. Yeah. Well, what, what are those partnerships? Can you elaborate a bit on, on some of those? Yeah, sure. Like as an example, early days, you know, one of the challenges against this topic of scale was mm. that, you know, we were managing client money in, in, a, in, a, in a non-discretionary environment. So, you know, every time that we wanted to, if, if, um, if there was... You know, a chat, we wanted to change an investment, or um, you know, God forbid that there was a uh, you know a um, the, the the need to to move from one risk profile to another, or <laughs> you know something like it, it was tools down for for two or three weeks while we um, you know I'm sure some advisors will would resonate with that, but you know tools down for two weeks while you prepare all these ROAs and do all these things, so. Early, and this is going, you know, 2009, 2008, 2009, we, we sort of recognized that there needed to be a better way. 
and the old adage of just hire another power planner, hire another client service person. Well, that's great in theory, but that's really only ever short term because as a small business owner, you're incurring the liability instantly in, in this hope that you're going to generate more revenue and be more productive. So it's a long way to answer your question, but what that led us to, to start to look at was, well, product development became a key part. I said, well, imagine if we didn't have to call a client every single time we wanted to make an investment change. Uh, imagine, you know, imagine, imagine if we were able to define a client's risk profile and their tolerance and their objectives and then have a structure that allowed us to stay within those parameters but make those decisions on discretion. Um, and that's really what started off our journey on SMAs and MDAs. And I'd like to say quite early on, I mean, you're talking 2009, um, you would have had to have been one of the earlier adopters of that type of structure, I would have thought. Yeah, and look, I'll, I often claim that, and I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't support that with any fact other than it know, just, it, it just it, feels it, like you would be because you know there's a lot of chatter, even like conferences you go to now. There's people talking it, getting up there talking about the benefits of of moving to that type of approach, and yeah, and you did it years back. Yeah, look, and, and again, I, I, I certainly credit you know our CIO today, um, Chris Willerton, and and. Um, and, and Anthony uh, Kaptanovich were, were, were really the two that, that drove that a lot of that strategy around making sure that, you know, clients' best interest, we were, we were still we were putting really the client at the forefront of, of everything that we did. And that product development effectively meant that we were able to eliminate a huge administrative burden from the back end. But for us to do that, we had to partner with someone. And, and, and we recognize we, don't, we, we can't run we can't build an SMA from scratch. We're good investment managers, and that's really what led us to partner with various platforms. and And the first one we partnered with was Mason Stevens, to, and they allowed us to sort of cater to what we wanted for our clients. And again, if we were going to try and do that all ourselves, one, it would have been an extremely expensive and an extremely long exercise. and And we've just continued to partner strategically with with you know the right people along the way. We know what we're good at. You know, we're, we're a good advice business. We're great at managing money, but managing a platform was never something that we aspired to. Um, and and I suppose the other key part was very early days, we made a conscious decision that we wanted to partner with accounting firms. Um, so, you know, that again, we, we sort of sat there and thought, well, we need access to clients. We've got this, this really, really cool investment solution now. We It's scalable you know, our advisors, we took away the admin, which meant yeah, advisors' capacity effectively doubled uh, without the need to hire these additional service these um, um, service staff. Yeah. So, we, so we, we thought, yeah, okay, we've nailed that, but now we just need more clients. Mm. And, and that's when strategically we said, well, we can go and get client by client or we can try and find someone who has lots and lots of clients. And, and back then, you know, accounting firms weren't the multidisciplinary beasts that they all are today. So... <laughs> That this concept of joint venture partnerships um, was formed, and 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 to this day is a huge part of how we do business. That so we strategic partnerships drive a lot of our a lot of our growth. And the and the just on like kind of continuing on that kind of theme, the that kind of accountants licensing channel. Like I I I get the sense, and I didn't know you back then, but but I got I get the sense that you were kind of really quick to. Say, so, hey, you know, all of a sudden accountants need to be licensed to do A, B, C, and D, whereas in the past they didn't. Did you already have that licensing channel by then and and you could kind of quickly morph that to be able to license accountants or did you just build it at the time? Yeah. So the short answer is uh, we didn't have it, no. Yeah. Um, naturally, we, were, we took great interest in sort of the debate that was happening and that was in 2016. When uh, what would eventually happen was that the 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 exemption that allowed accountants to um, give financial product advice around SMSFs and investments um, was repelled on the first of July two thousand and sixteen, and so in in essence, what that meant was that you know um, on June thirty two thousand and sixteen, a client of an accountant uh, could go into their office and they could tell them you should open an SMSF and we can invest it here and. And then the very next day, um, they had to be authorised, just like a financial advisor, to do so. And um, I, I tell you up front now, James, that I had zero interest in running a dealer group. Admittedly, I, I, I didn't really understand that business model that well. But what we did see was an opportunity, again, reflecting on our strategic partnerships we'd had 
with accountants through our joint venture models, we thought, well, what what about, we, we, I guess we saw an opportunity where we said, well, there's going to be some accounting firms out there that are actually really good at providing advice. And, and just because of this legislative change, they now can't do that. But what about if we partnered, again, strategically with the right firms and authorised them under our licence to allow them to still provide that financial advice? And and so we that's exactly what we did. We, we, we sort of thought, well, let's take the learnings from our joint venture model and our, and our strong understanding of how accounting firms operate and what they do. And then let's be really targeted about the firms that we want to partner with on and, and license, because obviously there's a risk involved if they're coming in under your AFSL. Um, and, and today, that, that's an amazing part of our business. I mean, we, we have some phenomenal businesses that, that we license. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in essence, what we've done, James, is all the learnings we had about how to build an advanced business we now provide that to all the firms that we license. So it's more than just a, a direct debit once a month and go and here's a Microsoft Word template. You know, we, we actually, we, we do coaching, mentoring, and we give them access to all of our um, infrastructure internally. So we write every SOA so they don't have to go and hire a power planner. We do all the implementation. We give them our client service team. So it, we're actually trying to allow firms to scale, mm. but rather than them having to go through what we did and and do it the hard way, um, they effectively plug into our infrastructure and and get access to all of our expertise that we've developed over the years. So, on that basis, it is quite a specialised offering, and and you know we only partner with with sort of the firms and the same value system as, as and, and I guess the growth mindset. So, yeah. if they're just looking to open SMSFs, that that's not what we're about. Uh, what we're looking about is firms that want to genuinely provide clients with a, a financial uh, advice solution. Gotcha. So, what is your what does your role look like today? Like you got the title CEO, but what do you what do you spend your day doing? Um, look, if, if my my days are uh, look at a lot of it's governance, uh, it's HR. You know, it's uh, I wish I was spending more time on the strategic things, but I must admit that's probably one of the challenges as you get bigger. Um, but look, yeah, look, my, my role in essence is is to drive strategy, um, make sure that uh, our governance is right, uh, make sure that our staff are looked after, have the resourcing they need, the support they need. Uh, and then naturally, I've got an amazing leadership team that um, my, my role is to serve them, you know, and, and, I, and I mean that in every sense that, you know, I mean, I, I'm in the office every day um, because I just love being around our people, and and I, I don't feel like I, I have anything to offer if I'm uh, if I'm sitting at home. So, <laughs> what is the like? What does the structure look like? So you need a 150 odd internal people, and then the and then there's the the kind of external licensing. What's the structure of the business look like to 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 run an advice business of that size? What can you run through the teams that are involved? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the benefits, James, of becoming a a bigger business and and you know i still uh, i'm i'm not sort of silly enough that we're so we're not an institution uh yeah relatively speaking you know I, I still like to think of us as a small business i don't think i i can get away with that as much these days at, at this size but um one of the benefits of being at our size is that yeah, you actually can have dedicated departments now you know when we were smaller you sort of had 0.2 of a compliance person and point five of a HR person and um whereas these days, yeah, you know, we've we've got some really strong structure and, and expertise across the group. So, you know, um so we've our advice business as a starting point, you know, because that's quite sizable. We've got two heads of advice. Um so that they they look after all of our advisors um from a from a coaching, mentoring, um support, um, management um perspective. We've got a, a licensing division, which has a team in and of itself. So there's a, there's a head off in that department. Um, and then he's supported by managers and analysts and client service people and an implementation team. As you can imagine, it, it, it is quite a robust team. Mm-hmm. Uh, client services, um, you know, that's a big team. Um, you know, I think it, it, across the, 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 the business, you're talking probably 20 people just in client services. Um, yeah, we've got a power planning unit. Um, governance and, and and governance is sort of split into two departments. So we've got a AFSL governance, and then you've got just an advice compliance um, unit 
um, and, and they do different functions. So one's obviously entrusted to make sure that we're doing everything from an AFSL perspective and, and broader sort of risk perspective. And then the other one is very targeted on, you know, what an advisor's SOA looks like and, and advisors are sort of asking questions about, oh, can I say this or can I do this? Um, uh, naturally, finance, finance department, when you've got that many stakeholders, you know, that one thing you, you learn quickly is is make sure your finance department goes real well. Um yeah, the last thing you want is uh, to to not pay someone on time or uh, get the number wrong. Or um, when, so that's, when you yeah. think about the yeah the, the volume of you know, clients on one side that are paying advice fees, you've got staff on the other side that need to be paid. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of ins and outs in different bank accounts. So you uh, need a, a hefty team to deal with that. Uh, there there is, and then you know na- naturally from from there you've got. Uh, our asset management business is is quite a significant part of what we do, um, you know, and that's got it. You know, it's CIO, it's got investment managers and analysts, and you know, so it, it's it's quite a big operation today. And 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 fortunately, we've sort of, we've got expert people sort of managing each of those. So again, my role is not to be the expert in all things, but it's certainly to um to to be there. To really set the vision, um, set the vow, make sure we, we stay true to our value system, um, and, and and really just to, to 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 drive that strategy across the group and be there to serve our leadership team when and how they need it. So, mm. what what do you think the opportunity in a business of this size is kind of going going forward? What what do you what do you see is kind of where to from here? Look, I think for, for us, I see the opportunity is probably being twofold. One. Clearly, the opportunity and, and and the one we never take for granted is you know, we already service more than four thousand clients across our group. So first and foremost, you know, organically, I think our growth historically has been really strong in in our ability to service our existing clients and and make sure we're delivering on our promises there. So I think organically, the opportunity for us now with such a large team and such specialization is just to continue to evolve and and develop what we do across our existing client base mm. um, and the services we provide there. And, and then naturally, I think because of what I'm seeing play out in the in the marketplace, I think, I think there's an opportunity for us to continue to grow by partnering with firms that maybe can't um, or, or maybe need someone as that strategic partner that I referred to. I mean, um, I, I'd love to think that, you know, there's firms out there that we can be a strategic partner for. And, and provide the same support that others provided us early in our journey. And, and certainly we have a big appetite for that, you know, whether that's sort of partnering through our licensing or um, partnering through our asset management business or partnering through merger or acquisition. Um, I suppose we still, we're still nimble enough to be quite open to having lots of different conversations, but, but I think the market absolutely has all of those opportunities present. You just got to be out there and, Listening and having the right conversations. Yeah, and 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 do you find you get people, you know, approaching you for the, for those kind of things? Like, are you having to go and seek it out, or or do you find people are people are coming coming to you? What what does that look like? Uh, yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, for many years we were we were only an organic growth business, and 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 as as you'll know, you know, more than two and a half years ago when Acambo and First Financial came together, that was a pretty significant transaction for both groups and. Um, and and since that time, it, it almost the best way I can describe it, James, is I think once you do one, um, and and particularly one of that size, I mean, both businesses were, were quite sizable in their own right. Um, it, there there seems to be just this this expectation. All right, well, it's on now. You're open to you're open to having conversations about everything. So certainly since that point, um, uh, there's been a lot more opportunity come to us, which which is great. Um. Mm-hmm. So I suppose it's, it's a it's a bit of both. I think you know you seek it out because that's the way you're orientated. It's part of our strategy. We want to grow. Um, but once you've done one and 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 you've got a track record, I don't know if you can call one a track record. Um, but uh, certainly the opportunities start to present as well. But and I think that just comes back to having a strategy in place because there's lots of ways to grow. Um, you know, acquisition is one, merge is another, organic is another, and and there's probably others too. But <laughs> That's not to say that you need to do all three or you, you know, sort of each business will have its own sort of beliefs and, and thoughts on how to do it. Um, 
But for us, yeah, we're, we're fortunate enough now that at this size, you, you, you can see opportunities you may not have. And I guess importantly, you've got the scale to be able to entertain them as well. So, yeah. yeah. What about challenges? So, you know, there's kind of, there's, there's a, you know, a raft of opportunities and, and things that you're looking out for. But what do you think are challenges that, that are, you know, maybe unique to operating a business of, of, of this size that, you know, different to the challenges a, a one or two person shop might have? Well, look, I think it always starts with your people. Yeah. I mean, it's quite, quite funny. Someone, someone asked me a question yesterday about, um, uh, about about our merger, at Campbell and First Financial. And I said, you know, you sit there in in the boardroom with all the smartest people across both businesses, and and you think you've nailed everything. You know, you've got your comm strategy, you you make it really clear what what you're doing and how you're doing it. And I still remember to this day that the first hurdle that we hit, which none of us had even given any thought to when we first merged, was the social club. <laughs> and 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 you know when we asked staff for questions i'm thinking we're going to get some really hard questions the first thing was well how are we going to manage our social club now and, and just i sort of laugh about it now because i thought gee wow if that's the biggest thing we have to deal with then, yeah. then then that's awesome but i suppose that that's the that's the point i'm making is that people and culture um and is, is always going to be the biggest challenge as you get bigger because I suppose one of the things that i often miss about the the smaller version of our business is the the ability that I had to sort of have really really strong personal relationships with everyone. You know, when there's five or six people, you know, you know everyone's wife or husbands or boyfriends or girlfriends by name. You know their you know their pets' names. Um, you know what time their son played basketball on the weekend. And and unfortunately, probably as as you get bigger, that's one of the things that just gets harder. Um, and I suppose that's a challenge in itself because I, I, I love and I, I, I think the strength of our business has always been that connection to people. Um, but what you learn is that there's other ways to build that connection. And I suppose that's really where setting the vision and the values, be- I felt, became more important as we got bigger because that's that's then really what, what binds everyone together. So whilst when you're a small business, it's that really you know, the son, the wife, the daughter, all that sort of stuff. As you get bigger, it's it's the vision, the values, communicating, you know, and what you want to stand for as a business. And that's really what connects you with everyone in the business without um uh, but look, challenges uh, challenges are a plenty. You know, I think talent's always a, a a challenge in the sense of retaining and attracting talent. Scale helps with that. So that that's probably that was probably more a challenge when we were a smaller business. Um, but look, I, yeah, I think in, in short, I think the challenge of a bigger business is definitely managing managing people, managing culture, you know, just trying to find common ground because when there's more people, there's there's different views and, um, and, and, and trying to make sure that you stay true to your label but, you know, cater to, to the majority. Try and, keep as, try and keep as many people happy at the same time. Yeah. It, it gets harder it, as there's more people to, to 100%. keep happy. That's right. Yeah, it's and, and maybe last last kind of topic to tackle. Do you think it's possible to to kind of build uh, the the, the you know, a, a, a decent sized business in the in the current environment? So you know, as I said at the start, a lot of the podcasts that I do are with you know one and two person two person businesses. They have these aspirations of growth, and some of them successful at it. Maybe some of them not not quite so. For, for those that have the desire to build something yeah. you know, of, of decent scale, do you think it's doable in the current environment? Any tips for anyone that may want to head in down that path? Um, look, no doubt it's it'd be it's doable. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I think it's just going to be it's just harder. Um, um, but certainly, uh, yeah, I, I I think it's it's achievable. Um, tips. I think have a strategy, you know, back to probably, I think the first, one of the first things I may have said when, when we were chatting, James, around um, if you want to grow, don't do it by accident. Um, have have a strategy and be really deliberate about it. Focus on what you're really good at and then have partner with others to help you along that journey as well. I think these days that, that point's probably more relevant than ever before. One, because of time, resource, and, and just just the pure cost of, of trying to do everything yourself. Uh, yes. It becomes a very lonely, uh, very lonely race if you're trying to solve everything on your own. 
don't fall in love with your own ideas. And, and what I mean by that is that yeah, you know, often I'll speak to to business owners. It's oh, we do this and we do this and we do this. We go, that that sounds awesome. And I said, well, talk me through the revenue breakup. Oh, well, we don't actually we don't make money on that. We don't charge for that. So I often say, well, if you can't monetize something that you're doing, why are you doing it? So I suppose don't get caught up in trying to be everything to everybody. Um, so define what it is that you're you're really good at. What what's going to be your value proposition? And and make sure that that's what you're amazing at. And I think again, I think that's one thing we've done really well um, as a, as a business, and and certainly helped us to grow. And then just seek out the help. You know, there's a lot of really good businesses, a lot of really good people who, if you just reach out and ask the question, I, I found there's been some amazing people that have given me a lot of time when I've needed it, and happy to share their insights and 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 support. So mm. you know. Don't don't feel that you need to to try and do everything on your own. Yeah, I was just just because another form of that kind of partnership theme that you've spoken a lot about through the through the recording that the, this morning that that that's as important as ever. Um, partnering in all different facets of your business to uh, don't try and do everything on your own. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, Joe. Thank you for joining me this morning. Pleasure, mate. Uh, good good to record this with you. For anyone that wants to. Reach out to you, ask you some questions. Where can people find you? Yeah, by all means. Uh, look, I'm I'm on LinkedIn, and um, otherwise, um, feel free to, to to jump on the website um, um, at, at acambofg.com. Um, otherwise, you know, by all means, if if it's easier, they, I'm happy for them to. You probably you may not be, but I'm happy for them to come to you and for you to make the connection. <laughs> given you're you're the uh, social media king, of, we'll, uh, this this yeah. is all new to me. So. If someone, yeah, if anyone listening, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll work out a way to get you to speak to Joe if, uh, if you've got some questions. So, thanks, uh, thanks Joe, for having me, James. Good on you. Pleasure. Mate.